So Caroline, at Benefits Alliance, we talk a fair bit about a lot of mental health solutions for organizations. And typically they can sometimes be reactive situations where there's maybe a lot of people are, are struggling in life and look for some immediate help or concerns. But today we've got a real special guest to look at mental health differently and how to make people healthier from a mental standpoint. And it's called the mental gym. Yeah, it's very, very interesting. Uh, when I think about employers who are looking for something what's different that I can do that is proactive, that is going to be something for everyone and have definitely people talking around the, the water cooler afterwards. But I think what we're really going to find out is something that's unique that just like a fine-tuned athlete that is ready to push themselves to performance, this is something people are mentally well and, and they're ready for that next level. They're going to show up to work as a 10. And the performance for their personal and professional lives is second to none. And it can really help so many people within the organization. And it's not a big time commitment either, which is also critical you know, for, uh, for people that are looking for kind of some solutions in a very busy and hectic lives that most of us live. It's a very unique team building experience and team wellness experience. And uh, really looking forward for, for us spending time with Corey Chadwick. Welcome, Corey Chadwick from The Mental Gym. Happy to have you today. Hey, thanks for having me. Tell us a bit about yourself and your background. Yeah, okay. I'm a dad. I got two wonderful little boys, uh, eight and five. Uh, I'm a husband, a mental fitness and performance trainer, and the founder of The Mental Gym. That's the real short. Love it. Love it. And when you, thought, when you talk about mental well-being and benefits alliance, we talk about the three pillars of people's well-being, their physical, their mental, and their financial well-being. Mm -hmm. You know, that three, the importance of that three-legged stool. And sure. all those legs have to be strong. And you've taken a unique approach is really you're looking at kind of two of the three of those, those foundations of that stool that we're talking about there. So how did you get into this industry and how did you get into this field? And, you know, the background of what made you kind of grow the, the mental gym? Yeah, uh, there's, there's kind of a few pieces of this. Do you remember that feeling when, when you were probably a teenager, maybe a little younger, but you felt like you had all this potential, but you had no idea what to do with it or what direction you were going to point yourself in? It's like, what does it mean? How do I figure this out? That was me. And I wanted answers to those questions. I didn't know how to find those answers. I learned that school doesn't really show you how to be your best or show up at your best in life. It kind of helps you kind of get by and be okay. It's not a knock on school. It's just, it's not really the answer that I was looking for. My mom suffered from mental illness when I was a teenager. And so this is when this came on my radar. Nobody talked about mental health. Nobody talked about mental well-being. It was just, it's a taboo subject. It was really heavily stigmatized. So she didn't talk about it much. She had to hide it from us. So for a while, I really had no idea how much she was struggling. Uh, she had severe bipolar disorder, and a lot of that was just long bouts of severe depression. And mom, unfortunately, tried to take her life, and then she tried again, and then and then did go through with it. I was 21 when that happened. There's no playbook for how to deal with that sort of thing. And I remember how scared I was that it could be genetic, that her situation could become my situation. And around that same time, too, my father began his struggles with addiction that have really unfortunately defined so much of his life we know that addiction doesn't end well for people and it doesn't let you know so i kind of had it on both sides that I, I can't turn out like mom and i can't turn out like dad both from the, the mental illness perspective and i realized that I, I had three choices really the same three choices that we all have even now today number one we can just kind of cross our fingers and hope for the best and hope everything works out and we'll somehow be okay i don't think that's a strategy second choice we have is to you know hope things work out and then if they don't then be reactive react, seek out some sort of reactive approach, and then hope to get back to some level of normal functionality. Again, I'm like, that's, that's just not a strategy for me. And then the third option was to be proactive, was to get mentally healthy and fit. And that just made a whole lot more sense to me. And so that began my personal journey. Uh, at the time, I was a psychology major, so I was already kind of into this sort of thing. And, and I, just, I just started piecing, piecing things together. It, it was really just like, almost like puzzle pieces. You add another piece of the puzzle, and another piece of the puzzle. And it was never about making big changes. It was just like tiny little adjustments and how you think and make decisions and behave. A little tweak here, a little improvement there. And all those little improvements just compound. And it's really what we do in the mental gym. It's the same thing. It's just how do we just consistently make these tiny manageable improvements that, that really compound into amazing, amazing results. So what led you down the journey now of wanting to help others from what you have learned? So it didn't start that way. I mean, I was doing this time just for my own benefit, right? Sure. For my own life. I wanted to to live my best life yeah, and good for you. be a better version of myself. Yeah. 
it was really people started noticing. They're kind of like, what have you figured out that we haven't figured out? And I had a couple of mentors who were really in my ear about you've developed something here that you got to be sharing with people. And but what really got me it, it moved in this direction was when my first son was born. And I remember this so very clearly. I was in the delivery room. And I think every parent can relate to that feeling of responsibility of, wow, I'm responsible for somebody's life now. Like, I hope I don't screw this up like that, that whole thing. Um, but I also felt this, this real feeling of, I want the world to be a better place for him to grow up in. And I, I don't know, I've got something here that can at least contribute to that in some way. And I want to help. And so that's really what got me uh, on this path. And then you know, the work just kept evolving and seeing the impact it was having on people, on organizations, on teams. And, and, and one day I was in the middle of a CrossFit class and, and I really loved the group exercise model of people showing up for each other, supporting each other. Uh, we're so much better together. There's that accountability, but there's that like, I'm not in this alone. I'm in this together. Let's be our best together. I really loved that. I also loved that it was one hour in and out. I thought that was a really important thing for, for busy people with busy lives. And I was in the middle of a workout one day and just the light bulb went off that we're doing this for our bodies. Why aren't we doing this for our minds? And that's what got me started on the mental gym. That's a really, really important point. And, and thank you for sharing your personal journey. I think a lot of listeners, whether you're employer and benefits advisors, you know, user and members, everybody can relate to you know something in your family or in your environment that's not been positive Mm, right yeah Uh, and you want to do what you can to change that so coming up with this you know and transforming this into an option for people to take control of the future for themselves and those around so that's amazing let's dive in so what does that look like for what is the mental gym i get it's an hour a week you sure. got me so far. Yeah, I'm yeah. Like one hour a week. So what does this look like? Yeah. So I mean, just like we have exercise for our bodies, the mental gym is for your mind. You're not going to sweat. You're going to think and we're going to challenge you to think differently and explore new perspectives and, and, and self-reflect. But that one hour once a week is we're working on a new relatable topic every week. And we're just every week building a new mental tool, developing a skill, building a new habit, developing the mindset that we need to not just kind of be okay at life, but actually be our best to, to show up the way we want to show up, to, to think and feel great, to perform at a higher level. And, and we're doing that in a way that's just really human. It's real. It's honest. It's safe, super positive. Like the, the energy in a mental gym workout is, is fantastic. People really take to it. It's not therapy. It's not a therapy session. It's nothing like that. It's, it's, we're here to, to be our best together. Very interesting. So, I just want to say that with mental health, or you know, month sure. and all these kind of events, we we try to get people to take action, right? I think mm-hmm. that when there's awareness, so people will have education and awareness. But this sounds like something very practical. What have you seen for employers that adopt this? I, I'm picturing this, you know, either in person or online, one hour a week. You're bringing your colleagues, you're bringing your people together. Yeah, yeah. What does it look like, and and what are some of the outcomes that you see? Yeah, so it's a great experience for a team. Really, I mean, for member any any like minded people. Really, we're talking about uh, growth minded people who know that life is challenging and they want to put in the effort to be better and do better. And when you're surrounded by like minded people, that the experience of the mental gym is we're combining that really proactive approach to mental health. It's not reactive at all. It's entirely proactive. Getting mentally fit, we combine it with personal and leadership development. So we're working on kind of that entirety of you being the best version of yourself. And then that that third pillar would be that group environment where we're in it together. And so you see teams connect, uh, really connect in such a meaningful way. They build trust. They build mutual respect. For DE&I programs, this is, this is a game changer. From a team perspective, because of that, you're going to see teams who perform at a higher level. They're more collaborative and that sort of thing. From an individual perspective, you're seeing dramatic reduction in burnout, stress, anxiety, which is huge for everybody. From a performance perspective, you see more engagement, more productivity. From a loyalty perspective, people are, are truly grateful for the mental gym experience. It's, it's, we know that there's a lot of employers who talk about taking care of their people, and there are far less that like walk the walk instead of just talking the talk. But the ones who, who walk the walk, their people are grateful, and they notice. And so people in the mental gym, they're more likely to stay at their company for the next 12 months. They're more likely to tell their friends and family about this great place to work because they feel valued, they feel cared for, they feel invested in. And so it's a win for everybody, right? And especially as organizations over the last year, you know, also moving forward or shifting away or getting more back into the office. Yeah. Coming back to work. 
how to build back that team culture that they might have had before the pandemic mm -hmm. that maybe they've struggled to get back. So, you know, maybe from a hurdle standpoint, what are some hurdles that you faced when you go into organizations? You know, either, whether it's reluctancy or knowing it's hybrid. So maybe speak to us a little bit about what, what are some of the tools that you guys have used in the mental gym for successful engagement? I think really once people understand what the experience is, it usually takes that first workout because, you know, you come in, you're like, what is this thing? It sounds cool, but like, I have no idea what this is. And so you, it's, I always say to people, like, I can tell you what it's like to eat your favorite dinner, to love your kids, but you really got to experience that for yourself. And so once people experience it for themselves, they get to see that this is something that is for them, that is designed for them as much as it is going to improve your performance at work. It's for you as an individual. Can I just jump in yeah. and ask that practically speaking, like I'm thinking about going to the gym, you're the instructor. Sure. So you're at the front of the online room. Yeah. And you are week by week taking a one hour class and like moderating the students through this experience. So what, what's the last class that you taught? What was the subject of the day? The very last one, uh, yeah. digital addiction. We're so big on social comparison. Obviously, social media is everywhere and it's, it's taking a real toll on our mental health on our happiness, on our confidence. I could go on and on here. And I'm not saying social media is all bad. Obviously, there's, there's you know tons of benefits to it. But I think we've all seen there's tons of studies and tons of reports showing the, the impact on our mental health. That's not getting better. It's getting worse. And so recognizing that that workout is, is very practical. We're all addicted to our phones, right? And, and recognizing why we are, like, what's the science behind it? What's, what are these companies kind of doing to keep us addicted? And do we want to feel that way? We, throughout all of our, our workouts, and we've had this common theme of, we call it living your 10, scale of one to 10. Nobody in the mental gym wants to live a six. If you do want to live a six, cool, but the mental gym's probably not for you. And, and 10 is not some sort of perfect life. It's not like every day is the best day ever. We know that life has its challenges and there's ups and downs, and that's just part of life. So can we show up at our best as consistently as possible? Can we live our best lives? And so through that lens, when you're talking about something like digital addiction, how do you make practical choices to take back some of that control of your life over your devices? You're not going to stop using your phone altogether. We live in this, this world that we live in where our phones are a part of it. So how can we make sure that, we're not, that our phones aren't controlling us and instead that we're controlling them? And even that one little shift of having somebody say, put their phone down 30 minutes before bedtime. Well, they're going to sleep better. They're going to feel better the next day. They're going to show up better the next day. We do this thing where, you know, when I reach for my phone, because people tend to have, you know, you have a spare moment, you reach for your phone. It's like this anxiety of having that, that spare moment that has developed now with having digital devices. What if you just ask yourself the question, like, am I doing this automatically? Like, it's a habit, like, like I need my fix, or are we really being intentional about reaching for it? And even getting people to just ask themselves that simple question is going to reduce the amount of time that they spend on their phone. It might not be drastic. It, you know, you're talking the average person spends four to five hours a day on their phone two and a half hours a day on social. So we're not saying quit social and throw away your phone, but can that two hours, two and a half hours become two hours? Because if it does, there's an extra half an hour you get back in your life. And so little things like that, again, these really practical little adjustments that we can make in our life. But when we do that consistently week in and week out, all those little adjustments really compound. Sure. And you can see the math, four hours a week, 200 hours a year, you're awake for 16 hours a day. I think yeah. what you can do for that to get actual like progress. You can get a month back of your life. Yeah. Four hours a week. Interesting. So what are what's some of the follow-up you would do from that from that class for people? Because you know, if you did like a lunch and learn, we've done that, you know, for benefits or something, sure. your retirement side as benefit advisors. And sometimes like, you know, those people hear it and then they go back to their normal habits. What yeah. are some things that you've been able to do for mental gym? You get that follow through it also like you, you stay on them as they're yeah it's a great question and that became so important to me uh in like my personal development journey you'd go to even you know a two-day program or a three-day program and it's, it's like, oh this is amazing like it's gonna be a new me come monday but then where's all that support where's that guidance where's the community where's the the accountability to, to implement these changes and so for every workout in the mental gym people do something called self-work it's a little bit of homework that you do but what it really is is taking theory and putting it into practice it's great to talk about these things to think about these things in the mental gym experience itself, that hour is incredibly beneficial. But half of their growth is going to come from implementation. You know, am I using this tool? Am I building this skill set or this habit? And so what we're going to do is we're going to say, hey, go try this thing. And then come back next week and tell us what happened. And you get to hear these different experiences that people have of sometimes it was the best thing ever. And sometimes it was a challenge. Like, oh, I thought it was going to be easier. It was actually challenging. Great. Like, why was it a challenge? Let's hear about it. Again, no judgment. We're just humanizing this experience and, and we're all normal people trying to figure out life the best way we can and and when you understand that you're not alone in trying to figure it out um it's great and so we learn 
from each other. We learn from what we worked on and now we're going to build on that. So our next workout is going to take last week's workout. We're going to build on that theme and then we're going to work to next week's workout. So there's a real flow to what we do here. So you've, you've always got a little bit of integration to be doing. You're held accountable to doing that. There's that consistent guidance. There's that feeling of community. And that's so, that's so important to, to our growth and our consistent growth. Awesome. And I'm just picturing too, like as, as a first experience, right? An employer brings in the mental gym. I can just imagine, let's say it's a machine shop or accounting firm or anything, sure. right? You're okay. What is this mental gym going to be all about? You come yeah, in for an yeah. hour and you're going to have this topic that's not at all related to your workplace no. at all. It's a different topic that everybody can relate to you. And, you know, what are some of the early, you know, that first workout at the mm. end of class? Do you hear like the chitter chatter around the water cooler or do you get some early feedback of like, wow, like, what, what do people say? Yeah. I, I, for some people, it's, I, it's a new experience, right? They haven't experienced this before. And so for a lot of people, it's like, wow, I'm like my wheels are spinning. And you hear that a lot from people because we're making you think, we're challenging you to think and, and, and explore some different perspectives. And there's kind of, there's a lot to do and, and people are going to process things in different ways and, and reflect on things in different ways. A lot of the time someone will go away and just let it all sit in. And then it might be the next day or a couple of days later where, you know, the, the sparks start to fire. Um, so that's really cool. And I think changing your, your scenery too, right? Because I'm thinking about let's, you know, out of 10 people coming to work that day, there there's going to be some people that are feeling super amazing, yeah. you know, oh, right on, I'm going to take on the world. And then there's going to be the other end of the spectrum, maybe one or two people that are like, oh man, this is going to be like a hard day, sure. this, and they're in their, they're in their work zone, but it's almost like- And everything in the middle. Yeah. Too, right? yeah. And then everything in the middle. So it's, I'm thinking about the benefits of like changing the topic that's in your head, mm -hmm. just like you would change the scene of like being in your house and going for a walk around the block. To me, uh, let's talk about that, right? Each week in and week out, you're going to have people of all ends of the spectrum. And can you speak to some of the positive outcomes of just that changing the scene and oh, an interesting topic? Absolutely. We've heard a lot from people that that's their favorite part of the gym. It's just their one hour once a week to take a break from the stresses and the demands and responsibilities of work and home and everyday life, where for a lot of people... It's go, 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 and they don't have that break. But for other people, even if it's not all go, 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 it tends to just be like pattern and routine. And so they don't get their, their mind into a different space or a different, different headspace. And so this is their one hour once a week to take a break from all of that and just focus on themselves and their well-being and their growth. And they love that. And, and like you said, changing that scene, changing that atmosphere, we're not here to talk about work and we're not talking about that project that you're working on. Sometimes that stuff comes up in conversation because that's what's going on in your life. And, and to me, there's always, there's two types of stress. There's good stress and then there's bad stress. Yeah. And you've always got to be concerned, I think, more so about the bad stress. Like stress is part of life. I sure. see we talk about kids. I've had kids talking about putting down, putting down their phones. I could have a bottle of wine and just talk about that. Yeah. But reality is, you know, they always said like, hey, Stress is also necessarily, it can be a good thing. It's how you grow. It's how you grow, right? It's the excitement of big presentation or mm. giving a speech in class, right? You're going to be nervous to do it because yeah. stress will get up in front of your peers. So talk to us about how you guide people through that as well, because obviously stress is the biggie, as we know, that leads to other mental health potential issues. Sure. And I got a follow-up question on your zones, which I think are interesting that you talk. So maybe talk yeah. about that. So I, I would say that, consistent stress constant stress is not a positive in our lives you know there, there's you know, the, the, the physical toll that it takes and certainly the mental and emotional toll that it takes we've gotten so used to being stressed all the time that we just can't show up the way we want to show up in life and so yeah we like that positive stress of a new challenge a new opportunity that that stretching you out of your comfort zone to learn something and grow that's amazing people really respond to that but that kind of consistent almost like a mundane stress is something that we we got to break up and we've got to get away from life is stressful like i got two young boys I, you know, my wife just finished her master's program and has started a new career and that, that three years of you know managing all that and the mental gym it's like you know the, life is stressful i think everyone can relate to their own version of their stressful life and so we've got to get away from just accepting that as like well life's stressful and i just got to be stressed all the time because it's really taken a toll on people. And like you said, leading to a lot of other, sure. a lot of challenges. Yeah. Sounds like you might want to move or have another kid. Just add some more excitement to it. Right now. <laughs> the, well, you're bang on. And I'm wondering, so talk to us about your first session that you have in the organization. People are coming for the first time. You might have some people that are skeptical. Of course. So yeah, like walk us through that. And then is that where you kind of try to get people to put themselves into their zone? So maybe first start up, talk about like what they do in the first time. And then 
I think tell the audience a bit about the three zones that you've Sure. Well, uh, your first session might be different depending on that, that company situation. So you might be part of a program with here's day one for everybody, but you might also be part of a, a company just has an ongoing mental gym that's available. So you might have three, five, 10, 20 class times running each week and your people who want to come, they just, they drop in and they come to one. So maybe you're a new person of the company, right? Just your first class is your first class. So it's not going to be the first thing for everybody, the first time for everybody. I might be coming in at different stages, just like going to a, any sort of gym. Yeah. They don't start everybody at the, at the same level, but the way that, that our programming is designed, it, it's really great for that. But you're, there are certain things that you're going to learn coming in. I think we've got like three rules for every workout that we always follow. We treat each other with a ton of respect. We're always honest and there's no judgment. And that's just in the fabric of what we do. You understand you know, the vibe, if you will, the, the, the feel of this, because it really is like an experience that you're feeling like, okay, you're telling me there's no judgment, but, but there's actually no judgment here. Like I can actually just say what's on my mind and not be judged. Wow. Like that's kind of like a, a revolutionary thing or this person's just, they're talking about something that I can relate to because I've experienced that, except I've never really talked about that thing because we all got to look perfect all the time and post about it on social media. Do you know what I mean? So it's, it's, that is a very common experience for people to just, they kind of like exhale and be like, oh, this is, this is great. Yeah. It's, it's okay to know that things aren't perfect all the time. It is essential to know that things aren't perfect all the time. We're all kind of caught in this game of look good, look good all the time. My life's perfect all the time. Nobody's is. Why do we need to keep pretending that it is? There should be, you know, I hope a lot of really great things about your life. And I certainly hope that the good days and the great days outnumber the bad. We still have the bad days and we still have those rough hours and moments in our lives. And let's just not pretend that we don't. But also let's really focus on creating more and more of the good days and the great days. Because that's... You know, you, you want to not be sick, be healthy. That's, that's the answer to that. Yeah. Right. So talk to us then about this zone. It's like, how do you, is it, do you get, is it a self-assessment? You're sitting down in Caroline saying, I think I'm a seven. And I'm like, I feel like I'm a five right now. Like how's, how do you go about defining that or helping people walk through it? And then two, does it lead your team to coach differently because of what people answer? Yes and no. Uh, everybody's experience in the mental gym and everyone's journey is personal. And it's a really important thing. We expected everybody to be coming in at the exact same spot and growing the exact same rate. I think it would really take away from the experience. Um, it actually adds the experience that, that some people are kind of at different levels. There's kind of two uh, kind of like really high level measures that we're looking at here. One is that kind of best life, worst life scale that we're talking about. And just you don't need some sort of fancy measurement. I can ask you right now, like scale from one to 10, one being you showing up at your worst and living your worst life, 10 being you showing up at your best, living your best life. Where do you think you are? And people don't really need to think about that very much. They can usually say, I'm at a five, a six, a seven, a two, an eight, you know, like people can say that. Great. And then where do you want to be? Again, you're in the mental gym, that 10 sounds good to you and that's where you want to be. So I would say that, you know, we don't work with people who are kind of in that two, three range um, in that respect, but five and up. So you got five, six, seven, even eights who just like, there's, there's still room to grow and there's, you know, I want to be my best. But when it comes to the, the mental health and wellness side of it, we really think of it as, as three different buckets. And again, you don't need to think about this like, like some precise measurement or, or evaluation or, or some, that sort of thing. Just kind of very generally speaking, there's the red, the orange, and the green. So the red bucket is one that, that gets a lot of attention in the mental health conversation. And that's because... In large part, unfortunately, most of the mental health conversation is about mental illness, not actually about health. So we're always talking about people who are in crisis, people who are really struggling. And it's absolutely important that we do talk about that. It's a, that conversation is so overdue. I wish it was happening, you know, with, for my mom. It should have been happening 50 years ago. So we absolutely need that. We need resources and, and solutions for people who are in the red zone. That being said, most people, it's just only really about 4% of people who are actually in the red zone. If we're going to talk about mental health, I want to talk about health. I want to talk about being healthy and fit, where most people are actually in the orange zone. So we're talking about normal people who are experiencing just normal life that demands the responsibilities, the pressures, the stresses of everyday life, trying to keep up at work, trying to keep up at home, trying to do their best. They're juggling all this stuff. They're feeling stressed. They're anxious. They're tired, maybe exhausted, sometimes overwhelmed. And they're not fully burnt out, but they're burning. And, you know, you, you can add on top of that. I, I believe it's a tough time to be to be a human being right now. You got a lot going on in the world. Uh, a lot of people are stressed and anxious about AI changing the world, coming for their jobs. They're worried about their financial situation and the cost of living. They're stressed about climate change, especially younger people that are really stressed about climate change. They're looking for purpose and meaning in their lives and they don't know how to find it and where to find it. 
Uh, you've got war and politics and division and hatred and all of these things, and they're just layering on top of each other, making it harder and harder for people to to show up. They want to show the way they want to show up. Now, within that orange zone, there's there's really two groups of people. There's one group of people who are like, hey, I'm fine. You know, I'm not in the red, so I'm fine. I think there's also a real misconception out there that because we talk so much about the red zone, that people think because I'm not ill, I'm healthy. And that's just not true. It just means you're not ill, but it doesn't mean that you're healthy. And there are some people who are fine with that. Again, no judgment if if you're fine just not being ill. And and there's there's kind of a pretty close correlation to where you're on that best life, worst life scale as well. If you're kind of five out of 10 with your mental health and well-being, you're probably living around a five out of 10 kind of life when you look at it holistically. And the second group of people in the orange are people who don't want to be in the orange. They want to move up that scale. They want to show up their best. They want to feel great and they want to perform. And they want to be great parents and partners and leaders and teammates and, and can make a contribution and they want to be in the green. And so that's our third zone. And that's where mentally healthy and fit people live. And what we do in the mental gym is we move people from orange to green, or if they're already in the green, we want to make sure they stay in the green and thrive in the green. If you ask me, it's, it's a better way to live and it's a better place to be. And that may change week to week, right? One, one week you're green and then all of a sudden you've got you know a few days in a row of these overwhelming things that are happening and then you, you bump down to the orange. So For sure. It's learning that things that you're teaching as a class, you're going to have that toolkit that tells you, okay, what is the mental exercise I can do you know, that I learned from my group or do the individual that may just exactly. shift you back to the green. So I'm really curious about an office dynamic where... You know, not only do you have people in the red, orange, green, yeah. you've got uh, a dynamic where, let's face it, not everybody gets along 100%. Of the time. Mm. So have you ever seen some of the outcomes of, you know, that office dynamic where people are just like oil and vinegar, they come and do, do a, a group exercise like this that has nothing to do with work. Mm -hmm. Have you heard any feedback from employers about what happens to their team dynamic? As a result of this? Absolutely. So I'll actually go pre-office or, or company team dynamic. It was working with high-level hockey players and high-level athletes and their coaches. And I remember this one coach, he came to me after working with their teams and he said, I've been playing pro hockey my whole life. I have done a ton of team building stuff. I've never seen anything transform teams like this because they just feel like they understand each other now and they show up for each other. And he said, my guys will go to war with each other. They will lay down on the ice and take a puck in the face for each other. And he said, I've never seen this before. And so it was actually that, I remember that conversation is what really kind of shifted the mental gym in, in this direction. Very interesting. Uh, a lot more. Because you're, you're bringing people together for a topic of the week mm -hmm. and, and they're there, they're in the workouts yeah. and they're, they're maybe learning some different insights that their colleague or their teammate that they just didn't appreciate. Yeah, and, and themselves. And themselves. And a lot of self-awareness is built up here. So do you work with organizations, businesses of all sizes? Is yeah, different industries, different sectors, sizes. It, it really doesn't matter because the in a mental gym workout, it's limited to a certain amount of people per workout. So if you're working with bigger teams or bigger organizations, you would just be having more workouts running. So yeah, you can work with like Robin and Al's team. Great example. I think there's 15 of them, 15 people. It's going to be great. How many people do you usually want in a class? Uh, up to 20, 25, 25 would be the absolute top of that. But really anywhere in between, you can work with a team of five people. It's fantastic. The, you know, 12, 15, 20 is, is a really great range too. Well, and, and you know, probably like your organization or companies do wellness challenges. Companies always ask about return on investment. What's yeah. our ROR? It's really tough to determine an ROR for any type of like, like well-being challenges because there's so much more variables that yeah, impact it. Sure. So maybe talk about the the value that your clients have received, you know, the feedback from the program that they find in their overall say culture after putting in something unique. Yeah, I, I think yeah, what we're seeing is a move a little bit away from ROI and a little bit more towards BOI, which is value on investment, because it can be challenging to put, like you said, they're I mentioned that people in the mental gym, they're going to be more likely to stay at their company. They're more likely to recommend their company. But that doesn't, you know, if you've got an incredibly toxic boss, that's not going to completely eliminate that. So it certainly helps. But where you do see benefits, you see more engagement, you see higher productivity, you see that collaboration, you see people. It's in many ways, it's more of a qualitative thing. You hear leaders talking about the way their people are showing up. Wow, they come to work with so much more energy. That's one of the things we see huge improvements in, in energy levels in people. And people are tired and drained a lot of the time. And you can show up with a lot more energy and do that consistently. That's going to have a huge impact at work. 
You see the way that they're working as a dynamic. You see the way people are leading and interacting with their team. You see the way teammates are interacting with each other and with their leaders. That's something that you might not see on a piece of paper. You might not see it exactly there, but you're going to see it. You're certainly going to see it when you're observing it and you're in it. But you're also talking about people who are taking less time off. Uh, you know, I'm a big fan of time off proactively. Again, let's get away from doing it so reactively, waiting to like, oh man, I need a day off or I'm going to crash. It's like, no, no, no. Take some time off. It's a great thing to do. You know, uh, you know, there's evidence that going to see a movie in the afternoon once a week is great for your productivity. I, I'm a big fan of that. Rest, or, you know, re- recharge, that sort of thing. But what you're really seeing is from certain business metrics, you're going to see higher retention. You're going to see higher productivity and engagement because that just kind of comes comes with the territory here of your people showing up that way and feeling valued and appreciated and cared for and knowing that their mental health is a priority, that their personal leadership growth is a priority. That means a lot to people. This isn't like a, a strict measurement of ROI, but I remember a, a leader that I really loved working with him and his people. Uh, our very first conversation, I said to him, what do you want? Like, what's, you know, why are we talking here, essentially? And he said, I want my people to love their lives. And right away, I was like, we're going to get along great. And he was that kind of leader. He really cared about his people as people. They knew that. I saw how they went to bat for this guy. Like, they showed up for him, but he earned that. But he was smart. He said, I know if they're loving their lives. I know how they're going to show up at work. I know what that's going to bring to the team and into our clients and to our customers. And he said, you know, what do people talk about at the dinner table? When people are home with their families, what do they talk about at the dinner table? Work, their boss. And he's like, that's right. What do I want them to say? I want them to love their boss, but for the right reasons. And like, he's a really bright guy. And again, a fantastic leader. So to him, there was, there was no P&L that was going to convince him of the value of the mental gym more than the experience that he was witnessing with his people. Awesome. So, yeah. so Corey, thinking about, you know, physical workout, right? Everybody goes for that, you know, 12 weeks. Of, what does what my transformation look right. like? So when we bring that to the mental gym, Corey, what are some of the milestones that you see at the three-month mark? Yeah, it's a great question. So what we're really trying to get people to do in, in that first three months is to, it takes about three months to start to rewire your brain, to start to upgrade how you think and make decisions and behave. So what we're really looking for here is are people doing that in a different way? And they're reporting that. You can see kind of week in and week out how what they're talking about. You know, I, I did mention that everybody's journal, journey is personal and it's important. We don't want to say to everybody, like, you've got to meet this this measure. But we do see themes. Like on average, we see a, an average reduction in burnout of 44% within those first three months. Those people who are coming consistently for those, you know, uh, for those 12 weeks. Um, and you get that from survey results? Yeah, like you surveys. survey people how you're feeling. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Right. How, how are you feeling? You know, and, and compare that. Uh, we see improvements in happiness, engagement, productivity, feeling connected to team is a big one. And you are going to see people even in those three months report things like they're more likely to stay at their company. They're more likely to tell their friends about this great place to work. Uh, that being said, those first three months, it's a fantastic three-month program. Uh, we hope you don't stop there because we're just getting started. We offer companies three, six, nine month programs and then ongoing as well, which is, you know, depending on you know, what you're looking for and what you want to get out of it. You know, just like physical fitness, you don't like work out for a couple of weeks and say, I'm done, I'm healthy, you know, uh, and, and it's true for our bodies and it's true for our minds. But yeah, any of those options are a really great place to start. Final question. I'm so curious from the time that you envisioned this uh, and developing this, what's the most surprising outcome? or benefit that you did not anticipate that you've seen that you're most proud of accomplishing through this process? I can answer that in so many ways. One of them was like the very, very first program that was ever run. And I remember because you're going into it with not a lot of expectation other than this is going to transform people. In fact, when the mental gym started, it wasn't even called the mental gym. And it was for teenagers, high potential student leaders who wanted to go out there and make a difference in the world and, and really lead. I remember there was this one kid who joined the program and he didn't fit the mold at all of what I was expecting. He just didn't. He was, he didn't believe in himself. He didn't have a lot of confidence. He had just failed math. He thought he was dumb. He was very clear on that on the first day. He was like a C, D student. And he said he was going to be happy to just graduate school and, and, and get a job after high school. And the only reason he was there was because a couple of his friends really did fit the, you know, the mold of who I envisioned this for. And they said, no, come do this with us. Come do this with us. And I remember that, that first day thinking like, do I tell him it's not for him? Or but I'm like, I don't know. This is my first time doing this. And to see, to see this dramatic transformation in this guy was, was just so incredible. Not only was he so much more confident and, and he lost a ton of weight. He was in great shape. And it's like, I'm not teaching him how to exercise or anything like that. He went from a CD student to a straight A student the next year. He thought he was going to just graduate high school and get a job. He got into seven universities. I didn't teach them how to study. 
it was just about rewiring and upgrading how they think and make decisions, how they see themselves, how they behave, how they understand themselves and their place in life and what they're capable. Their friends would talk about the way he's showing up differently. He used to have the kind of that limp dead fish handshake. Now he give you that firm handshake and, and look you straight in the eyes. Talk about these amazing, he had a tough relationship with his parents and with his brother. He's talking about how great this relationship is and with his, with his, with his uh, teachers as well. And to me, this was like, wow, look, we're onto something here. And so that, you know, when you're talking with, with leaders and emerging leaders and then high potential employees, you're, you're not necessarily talking about grades, obviously, but you see a lot of those same things. You see people start to hold themselves to a higher standard, not with that, that stress pressure, but more like that, that opportunity that I get to do this. I get to be this way. And I, I've, I'm building the tools to do it. One of the things that I love the most is just because I, I care so much about being a parent and, and husband is the way people talk about their improved relationships with their partners, their kids, the way they're, you know, as a parent, it's not about what you say. We know that. It's about the, the example that you set. As a leader, it's the exact same thing. You know, we're all creating a ripple effect, whether we recognize that or not. And if you're showing up at a five in the orange zone, that's the ripple effect. So as a leader of a team, your team are much more likely to show up as a five if you are. But if you're creating a ripple effect coming from the green zone, showing up as an eight, nine, 10 version of yourself, that's the ripple effect you create. And so, the, you know, one of the most exciting things, I don't want to say that it was like, wow, I never saw this coming, but seeing how, how strong that ripple effect can be, that kind of like that rising tide lifts all boats. And so everybody wants to be a part of that because they're in this together. They're, they're developing the shared language and the shared understanding of each other, of, of, of themselves. Then you just see everybody, that, that ripple effect gets larger and larger. And so I just think it's a really exciting thing that people, one, get to think about mental health in a really completely different way than they have before because it's not about illness. It's about healthy and fit, which is just a different kind of conversation. They're working on themselves, being better and better versions of themselves, and they can feel that week in and week out, those those you know, in that very manageable way, they've got the consistency, they've got the accountability, they've got the guidance, they've got the community. And the experience is, you know, when you're asking, you know, what do I see that, like, as this continues to evolve, I think it's just exciting for people to, to understand that something like this is an option for them. We should all be prioritizing our mental health. And just like you wouldn't make a vegan eat at a steakhouse or a steak eater eat at a vegan restaurant, you need different ways of doing this. And to say that, you know, therapy is the only way you can work on your mental health, I think is, it's not the approach we want to take. We want people to have options that are right for them, that they resonate with, that are designed for who they are and who they want to be. Yeah. And it was like, well, most wellness, it's such a great point, Corey, is that this, most people are kind of in that middle of what organizations or hopefully everybody wants to teeter more towards that 10 out of 10 and not fall from that six, seven down to a two or right. three or four. You know, I'm sure everybody like Caroline, you can feel today, we can, you can absolutely feel your passion that mm. you have for this. So it's amazing to be here. Where do you, where do you, some of your goals for your organization going forward, knowing that the mental health, you know, it's truly our new pandemic in society. Yeah. Where it's, it's not going away. And it's great that there's a younger generation that is coming through that is open with their emotions and open talking about how they feel, which I is a positive thing for, for cultures mm -hmm. as well. But so where do you look, where do you want to kind of 30,000 feet want to take your organization and help people going forward? Yeah. I love the question. You know, we, we see like gym brands out there who everybody are familiar with. You've got a location on every corner. And while we do most of our work virtually, I see the same thing. I see a uh, mental gym being just as normal as physical gyms in people's lives. When you mentioned younger people, we're talking a lot of like millennial and Gen Z now who are just right. becoming a bigger and bigger Absolutely. part of the workforce. And they are, they're demanding their mental health as a priority as they should. And I know that some employers are like, oh, what do we do about this? But I see this as this amazing opportunity for them because as they prioritize this, as they really take care of their people in this way, and again, we're not just talking about taking care of people who are ill, we're talking about helping people be their best. Not only are you saving money, the money that you're burning before on turnover and, and you know, lost engagement, and absenteeism and, and all of this, but you know, the with increased productivity, with increased, you know, you're padding your bottom line instead of, you know, burning your bottom line. But what you're also doing here is there's this great opportunity right now for organizations and leaders who want to lead the way here, who recognize that this isn't some fad that's going away, that this is here to stay. And that as, again, as, as more younger people enter the workforce, they're demanding this. It's not even optional right now. So you have the option right now, you have the opportunity to really lead the way to be that type of organization who creates those mentally healthy and fit cultures, who helps people show up at their best and lead at their best and feel their best to be that destination employer. 
I hear so much from HR leaders. We talk with HR leaders all the time. I hear so much about how hard it is to attract great talent, how hard it is to retain great talent, implement something like this into your organization, and you're going to see a real change there. And so there's the opportunity, be a destination employer, lead the way, be the kind of company people really truly want to work for. And if you don't, one of two things is going to happen. It might not happen tomorrow, but it's, it's going to happen sooner than later, is you're either going to, look, if you, if you can't attract great talent and you can't retain great talent, your product, your, your company is going to reflect that. And so you may become irrelevant in a way as, as a company, or you're going to be playing a very expensive game of catch up. And the reason that I say that it's expensive is because if you're leading the way now, you've got a head start on everybody. And, and as they are playing catch up, you're always ahead in that way, because this is your culture. This is who you are. If you're trying to redo your whole culture from scratch, because you, you've ignored it, you've ignored wellness, you've ignored people's growth, you've ignored who they want to be and how they want to show up. It's going to be an expensive game of catch up. So you're going to be spending more money with worse results until you get caught up. That's so, when your company's in the orange or the red zone, that's right? When your company's Not just in there. people within. Yeah. So, you know, like we want to be proactive with our mental health. We want to be proactive with our business strategy. I think it's a great competitive advantage for companies right now to, to lead the way here. Well, and you look at a lot of people that are, want to go to a gym for the first time and work on their physical well being that they might hire a trainer. And, you know, yeah. and when people talk about their mental well being, a lot of people don't know where to go. So don't this has been know. amazing having you in, Corey. And uh, congratulations on all your success and, Thank you. and your journey. It's uh, love to see what you're doing and looking forward to seeing where you're going in the future. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for having me. This Thanks, is great. Corey. Thank you. We want to thank you for joining the Benefits Alliance Voice. Please feel free to share this with anybody you think would really benefit from today's podcast. And most of all, subscribe to the link below and subscribe where you find your favorite podcasts.